What's going on my good people? Mike Hidalgo here. Thank you for joining us on another FCP Euro DIY. Today we're going to be working on a 2008 BMW E91 328XI. Today on the E91 behind me, we're going to be covering the notorious, the well-known, you probably have it at home, N52 oil pan gasket leak. This is no news for you N52 owners or really any BMW owner, but today our focus is gonna be on the N52 X drive vehicle. So all your E9X platforms with that drivetrain, this will be applicable to. The only thing that may change is some of the oil pan hardware. Uh, if you have a manual versus an automatic, this car is a manual. Uh, so if you have an automatic at home, you might use a different bolt than the ones we're using, but they are all included in the oil pan kit that we have listed in front of us. All these parts are available on fcpeuro.com. And as you can see, we have quite a bit of them. Uh, this is gonna be really the more invasive while you're in there type of DIY. We're gonna cover almost everything we can. You're gonna need to touch while you're doing your oil pan gasket. Some of you may just have the oil and the oil pan gasket and the hardware. Some of you may wanna go a little bit more in depth and do engine mounts, sway bar bushings. However, the one thing you don't wanna skip out on is the hardware. A lot of this is one-time use hardware which is why we have so much of it in front of us, especially the oil pan bolts. Things like the oil level sensor can be reused. The car behind us, which is actually my personal car, has 245,000 miles. So we're gonna replace as much as we can because it is all original. Uh, typically, you're gonna see leaks anywhere as young as 60,000 miles. Again, this has 245,000 miles. So it's gonna be pretty wet and messy under there. Uh, definitely recommend replacing this if your car is leaking, especially if you're getting tired of seeing the stains on the driveway and or your garage. To name a few of the things that we have here individually, we have a Lico Mali oil change kit. We have hardware for the subframe. We have axle nuts. We have hardware for the steering rack. We have hardware for the sway bar. We have new bushings. We're gonna be servicing the front diff while we have this apart as that has to come out since it's an extra vehicle, new drain plug and flow plug as well. This is something you wanna service every 50,000 miles on its own. Um, this was done about 46,000 miles ago, so we're pretty much on cue for the vehicle behind us. Uh, we have new axle nuts and a couple other miscellaneous pieces of hardware that are gonna, we're gonna be touching while we're in there, including control arm hardware. You can do this job two different ways. You've seen our Gareth Foley do them many times on a couple other chassis. Uh, you can either disconnect the control arms at the subframe or you can disconnect them at the knuckles. I think today we're gonna go for the subframe. I find that a little bit easier personally, uh, so we're gonna go that way. But before we get started on this job, let's take a look at some of the tools we're gonna need for this DIY. All right, my good people, for this job, we need quite a few tools. Now, it may look like a lot here, and there is a lot, but a lot of these are duplicates. Don't be alarmed. Basically, you're gonna need a good ratchet set, a good socket set, a good set of torque wrenches, something that can handle eight Newton meters all the way to 420 Newton meters. We'll talk a little bit about that later and how you can achieve that. A couple breaker bars, we have a 25 inch and a 17 inch, uh, we may need both. Um, some pliers, uh, again, regular socket set, anything from a 17 and 18 all the way down to an eight. Uh, some of the more specialty sockets, that's gonna be a set of e-torque sockets. We have an E18, E14, and an E12. Uh, a hex 14 mil for the diff plugs. We have a hex five for the beauty cover hardware. We have a BMW seal driver tool. This will be linked in the description below. This is specific to the seals on the differential should you be replacing them, which I highly encourage you do. Uh, this tool here, CTA 5056, this is designed to pull the axle through uh, upon installation so we can get an axle nut on it. You will not be able to just push them in uh, unless you have maybe a really worn hub, which in sh should case you replace it. But this tool is awesome. You're definitely gonna need it to pull the axle through. You're gonna need your tow hook. Uh, it uses a factory tow hook. If not, we have this one linked available in the description as well if you're missing one. Uh, bungee cord, zip ties, those kind of things are also helpful. Uh, small pick, small pick, small screwdrivers uh, are going to come in handy. We're going to use a brass punch to drive our axles out with a large hammer. Uh, we have a 5 8 chisel to lock our new axle nuts in, stake them in when we're done. Um, European no spill funnel, always a great tool. We use this almost on every oil change DIY possible. A set of pliers that we're probably going to use with the CTA 5056 tool. Uh, 36 12 point socket. This is a 36 mil 12 point. That's going to be needed for the axle nuts. Obviously your oil filter wrench housing tool. Uh, an array of power tools. We have both half inch drive and 3 8 drive as well as a quarter inch adapter. A couple chemicals. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of degreaser if your car looks as bad as mine does. Uh, get some brake cleaner. Get some masks if you're going to be breathing that stuff in. 
Uh, as far as some pace go, we have Lucky Molly LM508. That's going to be an NTC's copper. I like to use that on the splines for the drive shafts. Uh, we have some penetrating fluid. We have Lucky Molly ceramic paste. Uh, some BMW brake cleaner that's usually really well priced and also available on fcpo.com. Couple tools not pictured here, just literally due to the lack of space, but you are 100% gonna need is A, a catch pan for your oil, and B, a support bar for the engine, so an engine brace. Uh, we're gonna show you what that looks like in just a little bit. And then random things like maybe a piece of wood if you're working on the floor with your floor jack and another set of jack stands to drop the top frame. All of those things are gonna be needed as well. Uh, today we'll be using a combination of a trans jack, uh, maybe a screw jack, depending on how crazy we get. And for setting ride height on all these things, when you drop your subframe, assuming you're dropping the hardware at the subframe itself, meaning the inside control arm bolts, you need a couple blocks of wood to set the car on all fours so you can tighten everything at ride height. If you're taking everything apart at the ball joint end, you don't need to worry about that. With that, I've talked enough. Let's go ahead and get started on this DIY. All right, my good people, to get started, we're gonna work up top first. We're gonna work on getting our engine ready to install our engine support bar. For that, this beauty cover does have to come off. Uh, in order to get that off, we're gonna remove this forward section of our cowl here, uh, along with the cabin air filter, these pocket plastics on the side. If you've done in, uh, spark plugs or ignition coils on your N52 before, it's gonna be the exact same process. So we'll start by removing a couple sensors, these covers, then we'll remove our cabin air filter, which is held down by uh, six eight millimeter bolts. Uh, one thing I recommend is the CTA 5360 tool, which I know we talked briefly about at the beginning of the video, but these are great just on any car. They keep the hood from falling and crashing down on you. Just a safety hood prop uh, clamp tool uh, from CTA, super helpful. So with that, first things first is we'll start by disconnecting our hood sensor here. We're just gonna unclip it and remove it out of the way. Just a regular little electrical push tab some alligator clips, and we can swing it out over here by our air box. On either side of the cowl, we have covers. This one protects the, or covers the uh, master cylinder. You have a tab on either side, and then part of the rubber seal coming from the cowl tees into here, and just kind of pinches it in, holds it down together. We're gonna do the, the exact same thing on the passenger side, so let's do that now. With that, we can move to the cabin air filter, which is held in by six eight millimeter bolts. We're just gonna take our impact and zap them out. You have a quarter inch socket on this. You can use whatever you have. The electric tools just make life a little bit easier. Be mindful when you tighten these down, you don't wanna use this. If you do, just go super gentle or you will strip out the plastic threads. Now we have this power wire that goes through the front of the cowl here. This, again, has been off many times, so it's gonna be a little bit easier than hopefully your nicer car. Um, it's just three tabs that clip into here. You can pretty much just pull them forward as these cars get older, but these are the little clips here that are holding it in. We're just gonna let that hang out there. And then we have an eight millimeter bolt, one over here by our ABS pump, and then we have one on the other side by the fuse box. So we're gonna zap those two out. And we're gonna do the exact same thing on the passenger side. All right. Set this hardware to the side, and now we're gonna pull this front portion of our cowl off, simply by lifting up and pulling towards us. If you haven't already, you'll see that there's just rubbers, uh, tees on the side, just like the front clips, or the front pods here. Just pull them off to the side if they haven't popped out on their own already. I'll release the rest of this. Then we have one more cable, sneakily hiding behind this. Just two little tabs on either clip here. There's one. Two. And three. Again, two tabs for each one. That'll release that, and this can come out. Now with that off, we can remove our beauty cover. It's held in by three five millimeter hex, two in the front, one in the back. Now with our cover off, we can get a clear access to the threaded port here on the top of the block. That's where we're gonna install our tow hook, if you will, that's gonna support our engine when we install our engine support bar. 
And for those of you that still have your factory tow hook, you can go ahead and use that and thread that here into the block. Keep it something like that so we can install the hook. For those of you that do not have this, we'll show you the alternative, which is also gonna be linked in the description below for you. This is what this one's gonna look like. This one goes in a bit more just because it doesn't have a neck around it like the factory one does. So you can use either one. We'll leave this one in here for now just because it threads in more. And I like the idea of that. But with that, before we get our bar installed, we're gonna go ahead and remove this air box. So we have access to one of the engine mount bolts on the driver's side. We have easy access to the one on the passenger side. We'll get to those in a moment. All right, my good people. Now at this point, we have our engine support bar installed. I have adjusted it to fit the shape of the E91. We have just a little bit of tension taken off of the mounts. Uh, we're not trying to lift the motor out or anything. We're just simply taking the weight off of the mount. So when we drop everything, we don't really have to fight that. But with that, now it's time to get actually messy. We're gonna get underneath the E91. All right, before we get crazy and start stripping the bottom of all the shielding and stiffening plates, we're just gonna start by draining the oil as that's what we left ourselves up top ready to do. The more oil we can get out now, now uh, let's be real, there's still gonna be a bunch dripping on us, but it'll make this DIY a lot easier. All right, we're gonna give that a few minutes to do its thing, and then we'll come back to it in a little bit. All right, my good people, at this point, we've drained enough. This could drip here forever. The pan's gonna be coming down, so we're just gonna plug it up now. We're using the old crush washer. We're just gonna put the bolt in to keep it from dripping on us while we're working on the rest of the car here. Once we reinstall our pan with its new gasket, we'll install our new crush washer, torque everything down properly. Next on the list is gonna be to remove the stiffening plate. Uh, just a quick note, I'm sure you are aware of this, but never set your car back down on the ground without this plate. It'll shuffle everything apart and it just, BMW says, do not do, so we will not do. These are one-time use bolts. Again, these are linked in the description below. We also talked about them at the beginning of the video, so we will not be reusing these. We're gonna zap them out with a 16 on our impact gun. We have 12 eight millimeter bolts that we're gonna remove for this front splash shield first. We'll work our way from the front to the back. Just be mindful that it is engaged underneath the front bumper. So I'm not too worried about this side dropping, but once we get to the hardware back here, it is gonna to wanna to fall on us. All right, we have another six eight millimeter bolts holding this rear shield on. Uh, we're gonna work our way from the back forward. All right, my good people, at this point, we're gonna start getting a little bit more into the weeds of this job. We have all our shielding off. There's really no, no right or wrong way to start taking things apart. You can remove the front dry shaft now if you like. You can drain the front diff, whatever you like. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna lower the car down a bit. We're gonna remove both front wheels off. We have two more little plastic pieces of shielding left that kind of go into the wheel liner. We're gonna take those out so we can access the rear bolts of the subframe. So we'll do wheels, the rest of our fender liner slash splash shielding, and while we have the wheels off, we're gonna blast off the axle nuts as well. So let's pick it up at a wheel and let's get to it. We have five 17 millimeter lug bolts. We're gonna go ahead and zap those off. With our wheel off, now we have access to our axle nut and the remainder of the little splash shield slash fender liner that we're gonna remove. Uh, since I have you here, let's go ahead and unstake this axle nut a bit. We'll get that off first. Just using a small chisel to unstake the axle nut a little bit. Once that's unstaked a bit, we're gonna take our 36 millimeter socket and we're just gonna blast it off with the Milwaukee. Now we can go ahead and pull off the rest of the uh, belly shield slash fender liner portion here. It's held in by three eight millimeter bolts and one 10 millimeter plastic nut. All right, that is gonna finalize the current removal of the bits here and the wheel well fender liner uh, on the passenger side. We're gonna go ahead and replicate the exact same thing on the driver. So again, we did axle nut. Uh, we also did the splash shield. Let's do it now. With the wheels and the axle nut situated, we're gonna work on draining the differential next. So we have our 14 millimeter hex. You always wanna undo the fill plug before you remove the drain plug, just to make sure you can fill everything back up later on. We have a small three inch, half inch extension on our half inch ratchet to break this free. And now that it's broken free, we can remove it the rest of the way. This will also allow the diff to breathe a little bit easier when we drain it. 
uh, just like you would when you're draining your oil, opening up the oil cap. And again, we have new ones of these. Uh, they usually come with the differential service kit anyways. Um, so definitely recommend replacing them. They have a built-in O-ring that does not like to play nicely once you reinstall it, if you reuse it. There we go. We're going to give that a few minutes to drip. Then we're going to reinstall the plugs just so debris doesn't get in it and we don't drip anything all over ourselves while we're working on the rest of the car. Now we're going to work on undoing our control arms. Again, I'm opting to undo them by the subframe. You can instead just do them at the ball joint end. However, my thought is that I will probably mess up the ball joint boots. These have been replaced. If you've watched our other DIYs, you'll see me doing these. So these are still in great shape. So I'm just going to go by the bolts. We already got new bolts. We have an 18 millimeter nut and bolt head on either side. We'll break the nut free and get the bolt out the rest of the way and get this bolt out. Just be mindful of the control arm. You don't want it to swing and whack you in the face. All right. With that arm undone, now we're gonna work on the rear one. There's that bolt. So now both of these arms should be free. So we'll just be mindful of these. We don't wanna whack our head on them as we're working. But with this, this gives us some playroom now so that we can get our axles out. So we're going to go ahead and work on getting the axle out. We have our hammer. We have a brass punch. We're just going to work the head of the axle out from the wheel bearing, and then we'll work on popping them out of the case. There is one end of the drive shaft or the axle shaft out. Now we're going to work on popping the back of the axle out. There is a special BMW tool that acts as a pry tool to get this out. Both you or I are not going to have this at home. So we're just going to use a pry bar at a distance with a hammer, a couple taps, and it should pop the snap ring out. Uh, we have a tool cart underneath just in case the axle decides to fly out, which I don't think it will. I got Mark on the other side too, just monitoring it. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, give it a couple taps. Right, we're going to pull our drive shaft out. It's normal to see some of this oil come out, so just be ready with a catch pen. We got our drive shaft out. This is the passenger side. It's arguably going to be way longer than the driver's side, so it's got to engage all the way on the other side of things. We're going to go ahead and set this to the side gently. We don't want to damage any of the splines or anything like that. Uh, we'll check it out. We'll wipe it down before we reinstall it. We're gonna be replacing those seals as well. So we'll show you how to do that. But for now, we're gonna go ahead and replicate the exact same thing on the driver's side. On the driver's side, everything remains the same, like we mentioned, with the exception of the front uh, strut arm. This one has a level rod if you have adaptive headlights attached to it, uh, which this car does. So we're gonna go ahead and disconnect it. We have a 10 millimeter nut on either end of the rod. I think we're gonna go for the top one. We should have enough room to get to it. All right, that nut is off means we can pull this arm out of our sensor over here and that can just hang out with the control arm when we separate it. So now same thing we have 18 millimeter bolt, 18 millimeter nut on either side. We can zap those out and get these arms dropped. While we're here and the diff is still mounted to the car and everything, everything's nice and solid, we're going to pop these old axle seals out. Now these weren't actively leaking, uh, believe it or not, but we're not going to go ahead and reinstall them, especially considering the fact that they have now been disturbed they were more than likely leak if we left them and reuse them. So we're gonna pop them out uh, and per BMW, this is super simple. You can use a flathead screwdriver or a pry bar. Make sure you're getting just behind the lip of the seal, not in the casing. And you just use a little pry bar action or flathead screwdriver and pop these out. Oh, that one came off very nice and easy. That's how the other side should have came off. All right, now we're gonna work on removing the front drive shaft. We have four E12 bolts all around on the front and the back. We'll start with the front. We're just gonna mark it so we remember to install it the same way that it came out. I think I cleaned this side. We have our drive shaft mark. We have four E12s. We're just gonna go ahead and zap them out. Same situation in the rear. We have four E12s. We're going to zap them out. Our drive shaft is marked. Also marked front and rear. 
uh, just to be extra, extra safe on the shaft itself. When we reinstall it, we don't get it in backwards. These are also one-time use. Again, you saw this hardware on the table. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and replace all of it. So don't worry about losing them. Definitely do not reuse them. Same thing on the front, just a little bit of corrosion holding it in. They do go into this lip here. So a couple of taps on one end, you can pull it out on the other. This one has been replaced at about 175,000 miles. So it's got another 70K on it. Still should be good. We'll check the U-joints and everything uh, once we have it on the table. But for now, our drive shaft is out. We're gonna work on a bunch of little tedious things that are attached to the subframe still. And we'll go from there. All right, my good people, we have this cooling pipe that runs across the front. It's held in by three 10 millimeter bolts to the subframe. We have one up top of here and we have two coming from the front. These are very corroded on this car. Uh, I'm gonna be expecting them to just strip or break, but we're gonna do our best to get them off. Uh, we're gonna start with this top one. These sockets are like barely going on here. So I apologize for the view. I'm gonna have to hold them down while I try to break them free. All right, with those three off, this pipe is nice and free. It's not gonna get in our way of anything. Uh, with that, we're gonna progress to these um, power steering lines right here. Now, this does have a 10 millimeter head up on top of the subframe under here that holds this in place. So we can either try to get to that with a wrench or we can try just undoing these three 10 millimeter nuts at the bottom, which should allow this sway bar to clear and should allow this to drop. Um, this would stay with the subframe, obviously. These lines would stay up top. So we can see if these nuts are gonna budge. If not, we'll get tight and we'll work on getting the 10 millimeter head up top of here. All right, with those freed up, that'll allow these lines to hang up here, which is beautiful. This will just come down with the subframe. This is nice and free. From here, we're gonna move on to the sway bar. We're gonna be replacing these bushings and arguably the sway bar should be replaced as well. Uh, it's pretty crusty, but for now we'll do the bushings. We have four 13 millimeter bolts holding on these caps to our sway bar. We have two on each side. We'll go ahead and break these free. All right, that should leave our sway bar free. We still have it connected to the end links, of course, but that's nice and free. That'll stay out of our way when we go to lower it or when we go to lower the subframe, I should say. Now that we have that situated, we're gonna continue working our way around. Uh, next really easy thing for us to disconnect is gonna be the engine mount bolts. All right, we have two E12 bolts on either side of this mount. We're just gonna go ahead and zap them out. There's two, let's do the same thing on the driver's side. Okay, that one broke. No problem though, we are replacing the engine mounts, but just keep that in mind. While I have you in that spot, we have the headlight level sensor uh, arm sensor connector we're going to leave it connected we're just going to unbolt it from the subframe it has one 10 millimeter nut holding it in place and we'll let it hang out up there versus bringing it down with the subframe risk breaking it on the way down now for those of you paying close attention you may have noticed that we haven't talked about the steering rack just yet we haven't talked about the tie rods or any of that good stuff you can do this job by dropping the frame with the steering rack and then doing the power steering lines or leaving the rack in place. So today, what I'm gonna go for is leaving the rack in place. Uh, I would like to not have to break open the hydraulic system. However, if we have to get to that point, we will. Now, my good people, we're gonna work on removing the two E12s that hold our rack to our subframe. Again, as I mentioned, we're gonna try to keep the rack in place. We can move it around, of course, so we can clear the oil pan. Uh, but for now, we're going to leave it. We have a E12 Torx and we have a 16 millimeter nut on the top side that you're not going to be able to see. But we're going to go in with a wrench to counter hold it. On my passenger side, it was easier to get a 16 millimeter socket on my 3H ratchet and hold that from up top versus the wrench. It was just not deep enough and it kept spinning on us. All right, we have our transmission jack that we're going to use to lower the subframe. Some wood that goes across both sides to lower it down evenly. I have this plank here just as insurance should it want to tilt front back. I think we should be okay though. We have six 18 millimeter bolts, uh, three on either side. I'm gonna attempt to break them free first by hand and then we'll zap them out. If not, we will just refrain to zapping them out. Now with all the hardware removed, 
we should be able to start lowering the subframe and see if anything else is attached and slowly to lower it down from there. All right, now that we have our subframe down, we're gonna go ahead and clean up a little bit, set it to the side, then we're gonna pick it back up by removing uh, our, front drive, our, our front differential, our output case on the passenger side, and go from there. We have four 16 millimeter bolts that hold the uh, differential to the oil pan. We're gonna go ahead and zap those out now. And this comes out. There is an O-ring on this inside flange here that we do have on the table. We will be replacing this one as well as the seal. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and set this on my table and I'll meet you on the passenger side so we can zap off the other flange. Same thing on this side. There is an O-ring here that we're gonna be replacing as well. All right, my good people, next, before we pull the pan, we're gonna undo the oil level sensor. We have an electrical connector tab on either side that you squeeze. Sometimes it helps to push in and then pull out. This plastic can be a bit swollen from being saturated in oil. There we go. Tuck that bad boy to the back. And now we have three 10 millimeter nuts that hold our level sensor in place. Be ready to get oil to come out from here possibly. All right, my good people, the time has come. We are dropping the oil pan. We have our E12 on our impact. I'm just gonna start zapping these bad boys out. I'll leave myself one on either side to hold the pan till the end, and then we'll drop that. Now we have two bolts in the back that hold the bracket to the oxygen sensor connectors. Once we are done with those, we have one more up top that holds the bracket. So we have one here. This holds and acts as a bracket for our soft line going to our clutch. Once we have that one out, now we can come back here and pull out the center one. And we should be able to drop the pan down. We hit it a couple times with a rubber mallet just to break the seal with the one bolt still in here. Oh yeah, she's ready to party. Wonderful. All right, my good people, at this point, we pretty much address what we want to address while we have the subframe out. Um, we've already prepped our surfaces. Everything's clean, ready to be reinstalled. So that's exactly what we're gonna do now. We're gonna grab our oil pan, make sure it's nice and clean. Our new gasket, we'll show you a little quick, cool zip tie trick to get the gasket to stay in place. After that, we're gonna go ahead and start installing our new bolts. We'll do a few just to kind of hold everything in place. And then from there, we'll get them all in. We'll torque them down properly. We'll show you how to do that. All right, my good people, we have our pan ready to rock and roll. We have a couple zip ties holding the gasket in place. We will be able to cut these off easily once we have it up there with a few bolts started by hand. All right, my good people. At this point, we have all the hardware started by hand. Uh, just a quick note, if you feel like your bolt's not going in nicely, make sure the threads on your block are cleaned uh, and they're nice and fresh. If they look a little off, hit it with a thread chaser, clean them up, and then try again. Um, we're gonna do all of these bolts to eight Newton meters. Then we're gonna go around and torque all the short ones to an additional 90 degrees and all the long ones to an additional 180. So we have three over here by the passenger side of the pan and the ones on the back of the pan as well. So we'll start at one corner and then work our way around and then we'll do the same thing once we do the additional 90 and 180. Now what I'm doing here, my good people, is simply marking the bolts uh, that I can see, so I can see when I've done a quarter turn. Obviously, you can also see that with just the way you hold your tool, but sometimes once you see so much hardware at once, it can get a little bit distracting. Uh, other thing you can do is if your torque wrench has an angle mode, this is the best time to use it. 
uh, a paint pen works well, Sharpie marker, whatever you have lying around. We're just doing a light little blue dot that we can see once we've rotated the bolt 90 degrees. Alrighty, my good people. With that, that is going to be all of the E12 bolts holding in our oil pan torque to spec. Next, we're going to pick it up with servicing the seals on the differential and the output shaft on the passenger side over on the workbench. We'll get new O-rings for the insides and we'll bolt those back up to our oil pan. We are on to the next step, which is going to be servicing our output uh, axle support and our diff. We're going to be changing out the seals. If you remember, we popped out the old ones earlier while it was still on the car. We have our new ones and we also have our seal driver, which is linked in the description below. Uh, I know this is kind of a one time use tool for you DIYers at home, but there are different tools um, you can get that have like uh, different adapters if you don't want to buy this one size tool. Highly recommend it though to install these seals. You don't want to do it without them. We're going to place ours just gently over the top. You can place it on the tool as well, whatever you like. Get that started. Try to keep it nice and level. I have a piece of wood under here so we don't do too much damage to the table. You can pretty much hear it once it bottoms out. Pull that off. We have a nice, perfect, flush fit. When we install our axles again, we'll put a little bit of lube on these seals so that it, it don't go in dry. On the reverse side, we have an O-ring. This is what seals up against the oil pan. We're gonna swap those out as well. Small pick, pop out the old O-ring. It's getting pretty flat anyways. We have a new one. Slide that over like so. And again, a little bit of gear oil when we install it, uh, just to help lube it in. And same thing again, my good people, we're just gonna install the new seal with our awesome seal driver, which if I didn't mention already, also sets the depth of the seal, the depth. So you don't have to do any guessing or anything. All right, my good people, at this point, we have our seals installed. We have our O-rings installed on both the support flange and the differential. Now we can pick it back up with installing these back on the oil pan. So we'll start with the flange and then we'll kick it over to the diff. All right, so we're gonna start with the passenger side uh, axle support. Have our O-ring lubed up. We're just gonna make sure it goes in nicely. Give it a couple twists if we have to. It's basically gonna seat itself in there. This hardware is reusable, the four 13 millimeter bolts. We're gonna to torque those to 21 and a half Newton meters. We'll get them all started by hand first. All right, now we're gonna install our differential, same deal. Some lube on the O-ring. We're gonna key it into the oil pan. We have a new O-ring, of course. This one's a little bit heavier than the support flange on the other side. So take your time with it. Oh yeah. And the 16 millimeter bolts are also reusable. So no worry about having to replace those. And then we'll go ahead and torque the 16 millimeter bolts down to 65 Newton meters. Now we have our diff back on and our output flange back on. Before we go ahead and install the axles, it's gonna work in the, continue working kind of in the reverse order. We're gonna install our oil level sensor just so that we can seal off our oil pan, not worry about anything not that it would, but getting into our pan. So let's do that now. There we have our oil level sensor. We're going to go ahead and install it. If you're reusing yours, make sure you install a new gasket. Uh, in our case, we are replacing it. Mine is original. We have three 10 millimeter nuts. We're going to snug these down to 10 Newton meters. And with that, we can swing our electrical connector back over. All right, that's nice and good. All right, now that we have our oil level sensor in, uh, we can work on a couple other things. The next thing could be the front drive shaft going from our transfer case to our differential. So I think we're gonna tackle that next. 
I'm going to wait on the front axles until we have the subframe in place. I'm really just due to the fact that I want the steering rack to sit where it's going to be. So I'm not fighting the steering rack and trying to control the hub assembly and all that at once. All right, we're going to install our drive shaft now. Uh, while we have room without the subframe, make sure to line up your marks that you made at the beginning. And again, this hardware is one time use as it is torque to yield. The torque spec for these E12s is going to be 20 Newton meters plus an additional 45 degrees. Uh, what we're going to do since the torque spec is so low is we're going to use a small pry bar. You can use a small flathead screwdriver to just kind of hold in the middle of the yoke. Um, it's not truly ideal, but you're not really going to hurt anything uh, by doing so. That, again, the torque spec is so slow. If we were doing like 60 Newton meters or 80 Newton meters, then we would need a better solution to kind of hold um, this front drive shaft. But now with that, we're going to get our subframe on our trans check once more. I have the subframe coded in POR15 just to help it hopefully last another 250,000 miles. Um, as we go up, our, my goal is going to be to get the steering rack fed back into the subframe so we can tighten down the Torx and the 16 millimeter nut while it's still down and accessible. Um, at least just get it in place. If not, we'll deal with it once it's up top. So right now we're just trying to feed the steering rack back into the two tabs on the subframe so we can get our hardware in order. Small flathead screwdriver through the bottom holes just to line up the rack a bit better. And to get one side started, we'll feed our bolt through. All right, while we have you there, we're gonna go ahead and torque the hardware down for the steering rack now while we have access to everything nice and easy. That is going to be torqued down to 56 Newton meters plus 90 degrees. So if you are dropping the steering rack like we are, you want to make sure you always replace that hardware. So we're going to take our 16 millimeter wrench, kind of hold up top. And we have our E12 on our impact. We're just going to snug it up first. And now we can torque down to 56 Newton meters plus 90 degrees. All right, now with that, we can continue going up, uh, being mindful of our coolant pipe up front and our power steering line. We'll make sure to tuck those in properly. Uh, you wanna pay attention to the front dowels on the frame rail. That's where your most forward subframe bolts are gonna go in. Let's get our six bolts and get those started by hand and then we can torque down the subframe and get rid of the transmission jack. All right, we're going to start by feeding the front bolts in. I like to use a little bit of liquid molly ceramic paste at the end of the bolt. Uh, there's not going to be any of that in the threads just to kind of help seal any moisture out to avoid what happened on the passenger side bolt uh, in the future. We're just going to snug it up by hand, do the exact same thing on the passenger side. All right, and then we're going to move on to the middle bolts. Uh, if you're noticing, those of you with a sharp eagle eye, the old hardware was a hex head. The new hardware is an E14. I will give you the torque specs in just a moment, but don't be alarmed if you are doing this job and the hardware looks a little bit different. BMW just updated the style from a hex head to a torque head. All right, now let's head to the back bolts. Those still remain a hex head. Those did not change, unlike the forward ones. All right, with all six of our pieces of hardware started, we're gonna to torque all of them to 108 Newton meters. We'll start with the two front E14s, move our way to the middle E14s, and then the rear 17 millimeter bolts. Now let's switch over to our 17 millimeter socket for the rear. Now with that, we can lose this transmission jack and we can work on torquing the engine mount bolts to the subframe. Now we have our engine mount hardware to tighten down here at the bottom. If you remember the old hardware, assuming yours are original, it was a Torx head. Uh, the new ones are a 13 millimeter hex head. So we're just gonna snug them down with the electric ratchet and then we're gonna torque them down to 38 Newton meters. Wonderful. With those situated, next on our list is going to be the axles. So let's lube up our seals and get ready to install some axles. All right, we're going to start with the driver's side axle. Giving ourselves some room to work here. We want to make sure our snap ring goes in all the way. Again, lube up your seals before installing the axle back up. 
Make sure your threads are nice and clean. All that good stuff, my good people. That will make this go way smoother for you. There we go. Pop that bad boy in. And then we'll feed it the other front. And just like that, it is self-installing magic. That's wonderful. We'll swing over the control arms in just a moment, but for now, let's repeat the exact same thing on the passenger side. It's worth mentioning I've lubed up the splines a bit to get those uh, to pop in a little bit easier at the end. Okay. And then we want to get through the snapper in. There we go. And then while Mark's pulling on the hub, we'll feed it over to the front. Line up the splines there. And wonderful. All right, my good people, we are gonna replicate the same thing on the other side for just a moment. Then we're gonna pick it back up by setting the car at ride height, and we'll tackle both the sway bar and the control arm hardware at the same time. All right, my good people, we have the car as if you would have it on four blocks at home, set at ride height with these X-Drive cars. It's a little bit tricky to just use like a four jack or a screw jack. Um, maybe a four jack at home if you have the car on the ground. Uh, would be your best friend um, but we're trying to do all four here so we just have four big blocks holding it up we're going to snug all four 18 millimeter bolts and nuts and then we're going to torque them down to 100 newton meters plus 90 degrees all right There's our 90. All right, my good people, while the car's still at ride height, we're gonna get our sway bar situated once more. These 13s are also reusable. They only get torqued to 60 Newton meters. We were gonna opt for changing out the sway bar bushings, but this bar in general just needs to be replaced and it's, uh, it's pretty wasted. So at this point, we're just gonna save those for when we get a new bar. All right, and now we'll torque them down to 60 Newton meters, and then we can lift the car back up to a normal working on ride height. All right, my good people, at this point, the car is back up in the air. Uh, we took off the front wheels once more as we were just using those to set the car to ride height for our suspension stuff. Uh, the spaghetti of hoses and power steering lines up here have been strained out a bit. If you did not take your line apart like we did half-assed and remove the three 10 millimeter nuts, you can reinstall that 10 millimeter bolt with this bracket like we showed you just a moment ago. If not, you can reinstall your three 10 millimeter nuts. Now we're gonna bolt down our coolant pipe. We're gonna start with the 10 millimeter bolt up top on the inside of the subframe by the power steering pump. And then we'll work to the two front ones as well. So we're just gonna reach up in there and get those sorted. All right, with that secure, that's gonna button up the power steering line, the coolant pipe, everything up here. So now we can move over to some more exciting things. We're going to reinstall our fill plug on the oil pan and the differential. We'll start with the diff first. We'll fill it up with fluid. Then we'll button up the drain plug. And then from there, we can reinstall our stiffening plate if you want to do that now. Um, I recommend you do that so you can put the car on the ground with the wheels back on towards the end. Uh, we'll check for leaks, of course, before we put the plastic shields back on. But for now, let's move over to the diff, get that filled up, and go from there. All right, with that, we're going to go ahead and install our new drain plug. We'll just get this started by hand first. Always start these by hand. And then we're going to torque it down to 60 Newton meters. There we go. Not a whole lot. Now with that, we can hop over to the fill plug. We're going to get our fluid transfer pump. And we're basically just going to fill the differential until it starts to dribble fluid out of the fill hole. And that's how we'll know it's full. 
Um, you can go ahead and spin either side of the axles if you want to get that fluid flowing a little bit more, especially since we drained everything, be my guest. Absolutely nothing wrong by doing that. So with that, let's go ahead and fill this thing up. All right, now that we've come down to a slow dribble, we're going to go ahead and install our fill plug. Again, always start these by hand. Now we can go ahead and torque it down to 60 Newton meters. Beautiful. We're going to remove our 17 millimeter drain plug. If you remember, we just used the old crush washer to seal previously. Now we can actually install our new one that comes with our man oil filter. And then we're going to torque it down to 25 Newton meters. Wonderful. All right, my good people, with that, we can fill our engine back up with oil. But before we do that, for those of you with adaptive headlights, we're going to go ahead and reinstall or reconnect our level rod arm to our sensor. So if your vehicle is equipped with that, don't forget to do that. It comes off the driver's side uh, control arms. And then we can go ahead and reinstall our stiffening plate and put some oil in this thing. And we'll just use a 10 mil on our quarter inch ratchet. These just get snugged up. You don't have to go too tight. Once it's snug, that's good. All right, my good people, we're going to demonstrate how to get our axle sucked through and then our axle nut on, on the passenger side. The steps are going to be identical for the driver's side. Again, we're going to use this fancy um, axle puller tool, tool that we mentioned at the beginning, the CTA tool. This uses the M27 by one and a half uh, thread pitch adapter. We're going to get this one on our axle. Make sure we situate it as far as we can. We don't want to strip the threads on the end of our axle shaft. All right, that should be pretty bottomed out. Now we're going to actually install the tool that's going to pull this through. Pretty straightforward. You can probably replicate this portion of it with some sort of PCB piping, but this you need to be exact and on your axle. This goes over like so. This is going to feed through and thread into the uh, socket, if you will, that we just threaded onto the end of our axle. Once it stops on its own, leave it there. You can back it up a hair if you want so it doesn't jam up. Then we're gonna bring our nut in. So I believe it's a 30 mil. If you have a 30 mil uh, wrench, you can use that. We're just gonna use some pliers for today. And we're just going to do this until it basically stops on its own. You'll feel it bottom out and that will be the axle pulling all the way through back into our hub. All right, that's bottomed out there. Now we're going to take our new axle nut. I still have the gear oil out from uh, lubing up the uh, differential. We're just going to apply a little bit of oil to the back of the nut, not on the threads, not anywhere else, just a pinch just to help torque down this nut properly. That's per BMW. That's not per me. I just got a little bit of oil on my finger. That's it. Just a nice light lube. Now with that, we can get that started by hand. And we're going to torque this 36 millimeter socket to 420 Newton meters. We have our screwdriver still in place to keep everything from spinning. At this point, we have our nut bottomed out. We're going to take our torque wrench. I'm going to set the car a bit higher. Um, you can either set it lower or higher so you can get the most leverage you can. I'm going to try to use my body weight, which I got plenty of, to torque this down to 420 Newton meters. And then once we get that click, we'll take it back up with staking down the locking nut. Again, we're torquing this down to 420 Newton meters. All right, we have our chisel. We're eye level again. We're going to lock in this locking nut on our axle using a chisel and a hammer, just breaking in the end so that they key into the uh, axle and they don't come undone. So again, with that, you're gonna do the exact same thing on the driver's side. From here, my good people, we're gonna move on. We're not gonna put our wheel on just yet as we're gonna have to get in here for the fender liner and the splash shields, all that good stuff. So let's head up top for the first time since we started this whole thing. Remove that engine support bar, start buttoning up some things up there, get some oil in the engine. All right, my good people. Next, we're going to remove this engine support bar. Now we have our beauty cover, my good people. We're going to reinstall this so we can reinstall our cowling and make this look like a regular engine bay once again. All 
We have three five millimeter hex bolts that hold this cover down to our cylinder head. With that, now we're gonna grab our actual cowl. This is basically just gonna key in to the top of the seal right here. You see these little tabs, we have one on each end. Those are gonna pinch the seal. So this is gonna sit against the top, this will be on the bottom. We're gonna go in at an angle, make sure that we're pretty aligned. Look at the ends where the eight millimeter bolts go and see if you're close. Now just remember you're fighting that little rubber T. If you feel any resistance, it's from that. And just push it forward once you have it pretty lined up. And while we still have some play in it, we're gonna pull our power cable through and get that fed in into this area. With the three clips, two tabs on each one. All right, now we can install the eight millimeter bolts, one on either end. And we'll do the same on the other side. Now we can install our cabin air filter once more. That's held in by six eight millimeter bolts as well. Don't pinch any wires in here for your level sensor for the brake fluid or the uh, hood sensor. Then we can route the plug back to our sensor here. This post here is missing for this uh, alligator clip. Uh, as you can see, it's broken off uh, in the alligator clip. We can probably glue that one back on later. That one can go there. And we just plug in the electrical connector, pretty standard. And now we can do the exact same thing on the passenger side. Up in the middle of the cowl, we have the other power wires running through our battery cable. This just clips back in. Very unsatisfying. Now we can go ahead and reinstall or install our new oil filter if you've gone as far as changing the filter on this job, which I hope you did. And then we'll fill it up, I mean it this time, finally, with some oil. All right, we have our CTA European No Spill oil funnel in place already. These catch on and lock on the same way your oil cap would, which just makes life a lot easier when you're filling everything with oil. Uh, we're going to replace the O-rings on our oil filter housing cap. Small pick. You know the drill, my good people. If you've done this before, this should be a no-brainer. We're going to pop off the green seal. Oil filter comes with a new one. Just using a small pick, you can use a small flathead screwdriver as well. Whatever you have lying around the shop or the driveway. Take that big O-ring out, replace that as well. Be mindful, the O-ring does not sit all the way at the bottom of the cap, nor does it sit in the threaded portion. There's a special dedicated channel for that O-ring. Just keep it there and you'll be good to rock and roll. A little bit of oil to lube up the O-rings. Yeah, just a tiny hair left in the oil filter housing, so we'll use that, no problem. We have our new man filter. We're gonna go ahead and pop that on. Goes on either way. Make sure it's seated all the way in. Get this bad boy started by hand. Ideally, you could probably get it to torque, uh, the torque spec, just by doing it by hand. It's 25 Newton meters. It's not a whole lot. I'm gonna go until it bottoms out. We do have a torque wrench though, just so we can double check our work. We don't want any leaks, especially after trying to annihilate and stop our, our leaks. So 25 Newton meters, we were basically there. Now we can grab our seven liters of liquid gold. I like to put all seven in my N52. Again, it's got a ton of miles, a little bit of smoke at startup sometimes. Um, it's gonna be fine. Hi, my good people. The car has been running for about five, 10 minutes. Uh, it's looking pretty good. This is some residual from before when we were cleaning that we didn't get off. Uh, but otherwise, I'm not seeing any leaks. So very, very happy. So with that, we're gonna pick it back up by installing our stiffening plate, our skid shield, our splash shields, and the wheels. So let's get to it. My good people, we're gonna install the little corner half shield, half 
wheel liner uh, pieces in first as our bottom shields attached to those typically. Uh, so we're just gonna line these up, get these into place. We have a couple eight millimeter bolts and a 10 millimeter plastic nut. The nuts towards the side skirt over here. We'll get that one started first with a 10 on our small impact. Wonderful, then we'll switch over to our eight mil socket. The same process on, on the driver's side. All right, we have another six eight millimeter bolts holding on this back piece. Uh, really, we're just working in the reverse order um, of how we took things apart. Now we're gonna install the forward portion of our splash shields here. This one tucks in underneath the bumper. So that'll hold it for us a little bit while we get it situated here in the back. Now we can install our stiffening plate and this is a much better after than the before that we started with, which was the whole reason why we did this job in the first place. Again, one time use hardware, 56 Newton meters plus an additional 90 degrees. We have come to the end, my good people. We are throwing our wheels back on. Goes without saying, do the same on the other side of the vehicle as we are doing over here. With your wheels, you always want to get these snugged on first. Always start your lug bolts by hand. Then we're going to finish it up by putting it on the ground and giving them the final torque down. With the car back down on the ground, we're going to do the final torque, 90 foot pounds, 120 Newton meters in a crisscross pattern. Always want to do them in a crisscross pattern. And with that, my good people, we are going to conclude this DIY for today. Uh, definitely a big job on the E9X chassis. Certainly not impossible. A lift makes it a lot easier. But for those of you following along at home in the driveway or in the garage, it is still definitely doable. Get yourself a second set of hands. It's nothing, there's nothing wrong with having help, especially in a big job like this. Take your time, clean everything up, degrease everything, because you really only want to do this once, and hopefully you only ever have to do this once. So if you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments on what we did today, leave those in the comment section below. And if you like this DIY and you want to see more like them, please consider subscribing. We make new ones all the time. As always, thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.